So, as you will have just heard, uh, this meeting is recorded, um, and that's so we can show it later. Uh, so, we, so we can document the meeting, but also so others who can't get on the call can watch it later. Um, let's please use kind and appropriate language, not just because we're being recorded, but because it's good and decent to do so. Treat each other with respect. Oh, blimey, there's pings left, right and centre. People, people joining late all over the place. It's like back when I used to go to church. Everyone rocking up after that's meant to start. That's all right. Bye. So if you don't know already, I'm Ollie Armstrong. I'm the Northfield <laughs> Ward Councillor. Uh, I'm the sole councillor for the Northfield Ward. Uh, they changed the rules just before I became councillor, just uh, just under three years ago. There used to be three councillors to an area, shrunk it down. Some areas get two. You get just me. It's stuck with just me. Now, there are people on the call uh, who aren't from the ward. You're very welcome. There's always people turn up at my ward forums who are not from the ward. You're very welcome. Um, I will prioritise questions and answers to those who live within the ward boundary. Uh, and if there's time allowing, I'll then seek to answer any questions from anyone else from outside the ward if they relate to the ward. Um, if anyone is unkind or mean, I will happily pause the meeting and ask them not to be. If behaviour like that continues or any aggression, I, I'll happily close the meeting. Um, I have had a few instances of late where people have been quite aggressive with me, which is fine. And as I say, I'm more than happy to just stop, which is a shame for everyone who's coming here answers to their question. Um, yeah, so I've said we're being recorded, I've said who I am. Ah, apologies. Um, I did ask our MP, Gary Sambrook, to come to the meeting. Um, I know at the last two meetings, residents have asked for him to attend. He couldn't come. I have invited him to the December the 14th meeting. We've got a December award for him. Can't make that. I have said to him, pick a date in January. We'll work around you. I'll put the meeting around whatever date you can do. Uh, he hasn't replied. So I will ask you again because I know a lot of residents wanted to put a number of questions to Gary. Um, specific ones that have come up at the last meetings were... Uh, he said he's had regular meetings with Blower Homes at the golf course, so we've asked about the minutes. We'd like to see that documented. Um, a lot of residents asked about uh, making sure we support vulnerable children who uh, need extra food help and families who need food help. A lot of you wanted to put questions like that to him. Um, I will ask him again and see if he can come in January. Any other apologies? No. Okay, also, if you could note that Jason can't come, who is down to speak on St. Lawrence School. He's poorly from just sense of Well Will do. Thank you. Right, I am going to hand over to Hamira, who's going to talk to us about uh, COVID-19 from the council. Just to say, please hold your questions till the end. If you feel you can't, don't say them, put them in the chat. Please mute your mics until you're called. Please respect the answers you get, even if they're not the ones you're looking for. Thank you. Amira. Thank you very much, Councillor Armstrong, and good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Hamara Sultan. I'm a member of Justin Barney's um, public health team, one of his consultants. Um, I'm conscious there's a bit of a lag on my video and my, my speech. Can everybody hear me OK? Can we just get a nod? Yep, brilliant. OK. Um, and it's great to have such a fantastic turnout. I'm, I have to say this is probably the most well-attended ward forum that I've had, Councillor Armstrong, so um, so yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the way I, I normally kind of kind of, you know, take COVID-19 at a ward forum, give you just a bit of stats as to where things are at kind of in Birmingham um, and how we compare across the rest of the country, talk a little bit about Northfield as well, so about the specific ward that we're talking about today. And then some of the kind of national messages that are coming out um, and also some of the local opportunities that might be of interest to people as well. And then I'm happy to take any any questions and I'll do my absolute best to to answer them. And, you know, as ever, if, if we can't get an answer to you straight away, then, you know, we'll find it. We'll, we'll do so you know, in the week and, and get get back to offices to, to get back in touch with you. So. So just in terms of where we're currently at in Birmingham, so it's it's good news in terms of the rate of COVID-19. We've seen quite a consistent decline um, kind of during lockdown and, and, it, and it's continuing to do so. So if I kind of take you back kind of to the middle of November, 
um, we, we we tend to we tend to look at um, what we call a seven day case rate. So we look at a seven day block. So rather than looking at all the cases that we've had since the beginning of March, April, when when the cases were starting to be counted, um, you know, I, I will look at the last seven days, and that helps us to see if kind of local interventions are making a difference. So going back to the middle of November, our case rate was 335 per hundred thousand. And now um, when we look at um, the rate literally from last week and that the last seven days, it was 225. So over 100 difference, um, which is really positive news. Um, if you look at us in Birmingham, compare us to the rest of the country, we're the 26th highest in the country um, compared to other local authorities. And again, we think that most of our cases are happening through social interactions, um, you know, people meeting up to um, different households, um, you know, so that, that's one of the, the key things driving the numbers. If you also look at all of the West Midlands, all the local authorities um, during the last, looking at this week compared to the week before, we've all the local authorities in West Midlands have seen um, a consistent decrease, which again is really positive news. Um, and just in terms of Northfield as well, um, the actual kind of case numbers in Northfield has been, been one of the lowest across all the wards that we have in the city. So um, out of 69 wards where the first ward would have the, um, the, the highest rank in terms of um, COVID cases, in terms of the number, what um, Northfield is actually 66, so right, right, at the, uh, right at the lower end. Um, so which again is what is positive for the ward as well. Um, just in terms of, so we've talked a little bit about kind of Birmingham, how it compares to um, the rest of the country, so talked a little bit about Northfield and how that compares to Birmingham as well. Um, just some of the key things that are coming up that I'd like to share with you. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will be aware that we will be coming out of lockdown and coming and then moving into our tiered systems. So um, Birmingham will be moving into tier three, um, which is which is the highest tier in the country. Um, but you know, there's several other local authorities facing that as well. Um, I'm going to attempt to screen share if I may, so just bear, bear with me. I've just got a couple of things just to share with you. And I'll pop all these in the chat actually, Council Armstrong, so people can actually reference them afterwards. So I'll probably do that after I finish talking. So, because um, I'm not able to multitask unlike other of my <laughs> other colleagues I have. So we just bring up Google. So if you, um, Hopefully you can see this, which is um, literally, so this is a um, an infographic. Um, Council Armstrong, can I just get a thumbs up if you can see this? Brilliant, OK. Um, so this is an infographic that kind of has been at Healthy Brum, um, which is our official Twitter um, so social media page that we have for Public Health Birmingham. And on this, again, I'll, I'll, I'll send a link in the chat to all this, but it just gives you a bit of an idea as to what, what you can and can't do really in the um, in the city from the 2nd of December when we come out of lockdown and go into tier three. Really important thing to really, I think, focus on is the social contact. So there's absolutely no indoor mixing of households unless you're in a support bubble. And also the rule of six comes back into force. So, you know, um, six people from different households can, can meet in outdoor public spaces, so parks, public gardens. Um, council Armstrong will know that my other hat that I wear in the, in, in, in the council is also around um, embedding the value of green spaces. So, you know, Birmingham has 591 of them, open, parks and open spaces. So please, please do, do make the most of them. Um, it's one of the few things that you can do to actually, um, yeah, improve your wellbeing, I would say. Education is still is going to be open as well. Shops are open. The message around work is working from home where you can do. You can probably see the tent behind me. I'm very much at home rather than um, in the office because um, I have a three year old who lives in that tent sometimes. Um, areas where we know there have been issues around um, uh, social mixing and COVID-19 cases propagating so bars, pubs, restaurants. So they're going to be closed as well. Um, but most are offering a takeaway service. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these, but a lot, some of this stuff is, I think, I, you know, I wanted to highlight some of, some of it, some of the key things for people. And again, we'll make this available at, at the end of the, um, um, at, at when I finish talking. What's also probably quite important from health and wellbeing perspective as well is that organised activity can take place outdoors. Some of you might live in, in near parks where there, there, there was activity before lockdown. 
and we're, we're just work we're just working through the regulations at the moment and to kind of work out exactly how many people will be allowed to take part in those so hopefully that that'll be published soon um, just another thing to kind of make people aware of, um, Birmingham City Council, we are recruiting COVID-19 community champions. Um, some of you might have heard of this, others might not have, but essentially we're asking people in the community to come forward and, and volunteer their time where they feel they can to help spread positive messages around COVID-19. So really reinforcing the guidance, um, helping support people and just, um, you know, about where to go for help and support. Um, especially around financial assistance and so forth um, and really we're asking people to be our eyes and ears and, and to be that extra support um, uh, you know Birmingham's a massive massive city you know second largest in the country so again I'll make I'll make that available for people as well um, mm. still, oh, I heard sorry I'll just keep going just for another couple of minutes um, messages around um, hands face and space is still really important as well so to keep washing your hands for at least 20 seconds often um make, keep being aware of your distance that you are from people staying two meters is still you know what we're asking people to do if it's people that you don't normally live with or that you don't normally go to school with um people you know strangers that you might come across whether it's on public transport or in a, or in a shop doing your shopping um and also wearing a face covering where it's mandated again you know and, unless there's a reason for you not to we're asking people to really get behind that um, and finally obviously you know we're going into December from tomorrow um, so people will most likely have heard of um, the government permitting three households to form a bubble over Christmas and again I've just got the link here to the guidance for that and again I'll, I'll pop that into the chat once I finish talking um, I'd say probably the most con well the things that I've had the most questions on is what do we mean by three households so the idea would be is between its two particular dates, the 23rd and the 27th of December, you can bubble up one household, can bubble up with two other households, and you have to stay in that one bubble the whole time. So it isn't as though you can join two households on the 23rd, another two on the 24th, and, and so forth. So it has to be the same same three households bubbling up together. Um, and of course, this isn't you know a must at all. Um, for some people, they will have decided that they, that. But um, 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 they're not going to to bubble up um, to try and kind of minimise the the risk of spreading COVID. So just to make you aware of this this guide that's being published as well. So if it's okay, Councillor Armstrong, I'll pause there and ask take any questions if you'd like me to. Yeah, that would be yeah, great. Sweet. sweet. Oh, oh to Leon, Leon. Leon. You, can you can raise your, raise hand, your digitally, hand digitally, or you put it up on the screen and me and. OK, we'll look for it. Just to say, uh, we're not going to take questions on whether COVID is real, because it is. Uh, we're not going to take any questions on whether it's dangerous, because it is. Uh, and we're not going to take questions on whether you should wear masks unless you have a health reason not to, because they're the rules mm -hmm. we're following. I hope that's OK. I'm always happy to have those conversations in in one to one capacity, but they're not the, the, the questions we're having. Any other questions on COVID and the council's response to put forward? Uh, Councillor Armstrong, Andy Brunel's got a, a question. He's got his hand up. Ah, uh, well spotted. Andy, unmute enough. Uh, thanks, Kay and Ollie. Um, Hamira, um, can you tell us what is going to be happening with um, mass testing, if anything? Uh, I haven't got any firm and fast answers for you, Andy, I'm afraid, but it's our team are working incredibly hard at working at what the capacity is in the system, who can actually do it, you know, how how many we could do. Um, all that kind of stuff is happening right now is being is being worked through. Um, you know, one of the things that we're most likely is going to be prioritised, um, obviously, you know, as a as a city, we're very, um, you know, we have a lot of students as well. You know, we have at least five major universities and other smaller ones around the city. So one of the things that we are concerned about is movement of a massive of a large number of people around the country so you know most likely they will that if you know in terms of mass testing getting getting that cohort of people um tested before they can actually go home um is going to happen but you know now that we know it's a question that's been asked at the world forum i can go back and see speak to the people in our in our team who are working on that specifically and see if there's anything more that more that we can release on that so okay great thank you very much any other? Ah, Kate. Kate Clayton has her hand up. 
Can you unmute Kate and ask your question? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> vaccine. I'm sure this is the you know this is the question that's perhaps on on many people's lips. Um, are there are there, in the city in the council are, are there lots of plans being made to uh, you know, be able to distribute the vaccine according to some government rules or, or whatever? Is it going to be the GP that we perhaps need to go to? So, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I think probably at the moment, the mass mass testing is what we're focusing more on, given, you know, we have these lateral flow tests that are now available and so forth. So I completely hear your point, Kate, about the vaccine. And this is going to be a mammoth effort and most likely will be um, a lot of the public health team will be involved in getting behind the logistics of that. So um, again, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask kind of our colleagues in Public Health England who probably who would be closest to the vaccine and the rollout. Um, there's still quite a lot of decisions to be made about, you know, who, who would get it first, who would count as the most kind of highest, highest risk group. And, you know, in terms of kind of seasonal flu, we absolutely have an established system in terms of who, who gives it to people. So, you know, GPC as, as well as pharmacists. And you know, I'd be very surprised if, if we don't use a similar um, method as well for that. So again, a bit of a vague answer because we're not we're not quite there yet. But um, but absolutely, um, it's definitely kind of people are very much thinking about it now. So good, thank you. Any other questions mm -hmm. on this topic? No, that's good. OK, we shall move on. Thank you very much, Amira. That was uh, thorough and lovely. And it would be lovely to get you back uh, to talk about the your other hat, your other role. Oh, any time. About green spaces. Any well, why time. don't why don't I either January or February, let's get you in to talk about that. Um, Fantastic. And just to let everyone know, I, I saw a wonderful, really inspiring <laughs> presentation by Amira and it was on Oh, well, lots of things around green spaces and, and, and responding to, to climate shift. And I think it's something many in, in in Northfield will be interested in and want to get involved with. So let's let's put a pin in that for maybe January. Get right. you back. Right. Um, thank you. Just to say, Councillor uh, Armstrong, I've, I've just popped three things in the chat based yeah. on what I shared as well. So people want to use that. But I'll, 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 say, um, I'll say goodbye for now and, and thank, um, you. thank you for listening. OK. Thanks right. for coming. If anyone can't access the bits in the chat for any reason, do email me uh, and uh, we can send you the, the documents that we've just spoken about. Right, I'm actually going to skip. Oh, I was going to speak to Jamie, but he's eating. <laughs> are you ready? Are you ready to talk now about uh, food poverty, Jamie? Brilliant. So uh, local resident Jamie, who's helping with our Northfield Food Service community response, is going to come and chat a bit about food poverty and maybe let you know how you can get involved. Over to you, Jamie. Um, can you all hear me all right? Brilliant. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you. Um, so many of you have uh, the turnout from the community in the past few weeks has been truly incredible. Um, at times we've had more volunteers and more donations than we've been able to handle, um, which is really really heartwarming to see. So kind of a bit of background to how, how Northfield Food Service started. It was started as kind of a, an emotional response to the decision by, by this government uh, not to um, extend free school meals over half terms to children that are entitled to them. So we are talking low income vulnerable children, um, most of whom are in poverty. And in fact, uh, Northfield is the highest constituency in England for um, percentage of our children entitled to those free school meals. Almost 38% of our children, uh, of our school children, live in poverty and, and their um, families struggle to feed them. And this is despite two thirds of them living in households where the parents work. Um, so there are some, and we, 
and we didn't believe that was right so we wanted to do something to help so we kind of we came together as a few local people um Northfield Baptist Church and Digbeth Dining Club who are a wonderful collective of independent businesses around Birmingham who provide food and and stuff and really nice food as well uh if any of you ever feel like supporting local businesses um and we've cut and over half term we provided meals um i can't remember the uh, i think it's 500 odd odd people we supported over half term um monday to friday just so they had at least one one hot full meal a day um and that was done donations uh it was fundraisers so it was donations from local residents it was Dickworth dining club and all their traders um making food for us even though they've had a really difficult um financial situation because of all the lockdowns um it was truly i'm going to keep using this word it was incredible it was really really heartwarming to see how the community responded and because we identified so much need um and there were so so many people were desperate for our help we are still going um so we are now doing every thursday evening we are sending out a hot meal again uh to vulnerable children to children in poverty we've also expand uh, expanded our remit slightly um so we also help uh older residents in isolation um various uh refugees who have no recourse to public funds and a couple of the um the women's shelters around around south birmingham um because again these are all groups that are really struggling at the moment um, and the idea that any of them should go hungry is is truly abhorrent to us um so um in terms of how you want to help if you want to help there are a number number of ways um uh ollie has just stuck the email address in the group chat it's, it's northfieldfoodservice at gmail.com and what we are looking for is drivers uh, people who can who can pick up a couple of meals on a Thursday evening between five and seven and take it to the people who need it also during the day from about three o'clock uh to five we need people to help uh pack all the bags um and then hand it out to our drivers um so if you are able please do get in touch with us um we're based out of, out of Northfield Baptist Church so it is a walk for it's, uh, it's not that far a walk for most of us in the ward um if um there will be we do have a Facebook page you can follow that uh and I'm sure at some point there will be another another fundraiser to help us fund our work because this problem isn't going away as um there are ch the changes to uh to benefit so we're seeing a reduction in universal credit which means the poorest in our country are, are going to lose some of their income over the co over the coming months um all the all the children in poverty that exist half term are still going to be there over the christmas holiday um and in fact we're planning something a little special for the 24th of december um because we want to bring a bit of christmas cheer to everybody's everybody's day um no matter how hard they're finding things um but also if you know anybody who is really struggling uh you can refer somebody and we will do well i'm not going to 100 percent promise that we will all, that we will help them um because there is only so much we can do but we will do our our absolute best and at the moment uh, everybody who's been referred to us we have helped um I've kind of kind of rambled a bit there, but if you got anybody's got any questions, uh, I'm happy to happy to answer them. Thank you, Jamie. Just to, just to say, because Jamie's very humble, but just to say, every every week, we've, every day we've done this, 
Amy's put together a, a, a team of volunteers and, and it's and it's kind of chaos and he reins it together. So thanks for that, Jamie. And just to throw out some of the stats of the work he's just talked about, um, we were we sent out over 3,000 meals over half term uh, and each Thursday at the minute we're sending out between 550 and 650 and every and that's because each family gets a few, right? There's a few people in each family. Um, and these are all people definitely, definitely in need. And I just wanted to add a couple of things to what Jamie said. So firstly, it's wonderful that we're able to do this as a community, but we need to hold in our heads that it's terrible that it that it has to happen. Uh, it's terrible that there's this kind of need. And I had a long conversation this morning. Um, someone from a newspaper I got in touch to ask about it. It's been interesting because they just wanted the good story, as in, isn't this lovely you're doing it? Um, whereas for me, I think it shouldn't be needed. Um, and so I wanted to make clear to him, this isn't just because of COVID, it's because of, 10 years of austerity, whatever your political beliefs, whether you think that was needed or not. We've had 10 years of austerity, which pushed many under the poverty line. COVID's just cracked the ice and they've sunk. Um, and the last point on this from me is, is you know, some people have said to us, well, how come that, you know, this, this, we're sending food to a lot of people who are in work, but the truth is the cost of living is increasingly high and the amount of people on very low paid jobs or uh, very low hour or zero hour contracts the amount of people on those is incredibly high and so that hits high high cost of living terrible jobs people can't feed the kids that's why we're doing it um is there any questions around food the food service uh kevin's got a question oh brilliant yes. come on then kev what's your question hello um i, I mentioned it to you the other day ollie actually about um the meadows how they're doing yes um, hold on uh, I just thought if I just thought I'd put it in now as obviously it's sort of linked, isn't it? The Meadows are planning on doing a um, Christmas hamper for uh, and um, which is obviously food and obviously Christmas gifts for I assume children in the school and that, but I don't know if it's can be expanded and if people can work together or anything like that. I mean, we just literally got a letter home uh, a couple of weeks ago now, whenever it was, just mentioning that if mentioning that if anyone needed the hamper just to let them know um so i got in touch with the school and said well you know are you accepting donations and they were like absolutely basically so i just wanted to um to, to just to mention that on the end of the fantastic work that jamie's been um, doing um see if there's anything that we can all sort of work together to to sort of uh, help all these people basically and uh, that is fantastic to hear that they're doing that. Um, we will, I'm sure we'll reach out to them. A lot of, we are working quite closely with the schools. So in fact, uh, during half term, all our referrals came in through the schools because they, the teachers see our children um, every day and, and know how hard it is for some of them. Um, so I'm sure we'll, thank you for, for letting me know. And I'm sure we'll be in touch with the Meadows to see if there's anything we can do. Just with, with, Kevin's point there about if anyone wants to help, if anyone on this call is interested in helping, uh, you can either email the Northfield Food Service email, which is in the chat, uh, or if you want to email me as counsellor, if you're interested in specifically finding out more about what the Meadow School are doing and helping that school. Uh, and then myself and Kevin can, we've, I've not had much more information. To be honest, I'd forgotten that you'd, you'd wanted me to raise this, Kevin, so I'm really pleased you did. I know we spoke about it. There's so much going on, gone on my head. All we've seen so far is a letter from the school, isn't it, isn't it, Kevin? I haven't had any further info. Yeah, that's what it is. I you had a letter at home with the kids. Sorry. I so let's find out some more. Anyone interested, email. We'll get a chat going and then and then let's do a big push to support the schools in our area and we'll link them up with Jamie at the food service. Anyone else with any questions or statements on food poverty? No? There you go, that's fine then. Just to say, um, so myself and Jamie and the volunteers running this, what, what we're keen to do is to turn it into something deeper that looks at the root causes of food poverty. Um, we're keen to keep sending food out as long as professional restaurants will give it to us. We'll get drivers to send it out each Thursday. Uh, once the vaccine's out, we'll potentially make that Thursday into a kind of community space where you can come and get food. The project, they were the, the homeless project, the support people who are on the edge of or have experienced or are experiencing homelessness, they have offered to look to fundraise to get a uh, staff member to offer advice every Thursday from the food service. Um, and there's also talk which Marcia from the bid might pick up 
from on in a bit. And there's talk about getting some kind of support work for the high street for the people with drink and drugs uh, and mental health problems um, who are on the high street quite often. And we could potentially link that with the Thursday work as we progress. So any of you interested in helping expand that to transform the community for the better, get in touch. We'll have jobs for you all. Right. Thank you, Jamie. Sorry to get you to talk when you were just putting food in here. Kind of metaphorically eating. Right. So we're going to leap on now to me. We're going to talk. We're going to box a few things together. Uh, so we're going to talk about St. Lawrence School and the area around it, the Meadows School and Quarry Lane slash the train station area. Now, uh, with regards to St. Lawrence School area, I was hoping that one of the highways officers could come on the call. Uh, Joe, who's often comes to our meetings, couldn't make it. He's deservedly got a week off, um, but we haven't been sent anyone else. So we're We'll pick up on this a little bit more with an officer from the council in December, but I'll um, I'll talk through it as best as I can around St Lawrence School, the Meadow School. Jason, who I gave apologies for at the start, Jason is a resident who's who's led alongside Andy, who is on the call, and some other residents are looking to do some work around the Meadow School. Uh, Jason is sick, so he's not here. Um, and then Quarry Lane, I can talk. About. So I'm going to blast through them and then I'm going to take questions because I know there's a lot of you on the call from these areas. So let's start with St. Lawrence School. St. Lawrence School and the area around it, uh, like many areas around schools, is, is incredibly dangerous for people crossing the roads, for children, for carers, for parents, for staff, for residents. Since I started as councillor, in fact, before I started as councillor, as soon as I campaigned, one of the key things residents were saying to me is we've been promised for years traffic farming around the area. Uh, making the road safe. It's something I'm really keen to do. Um, some of the smallish changes we, we think we're getting close to pushing through. The Royal Orthopaedic Hospital are paying for some uh, parking measures around the roads around St Lawrence and St Joseph's uh, in a kind of circular zone, uh, which is to impact the, the on-street parking around them. Of course, the problem with that is the knock-on effect is it potentially then pushes the traffic elsewhere. As I've always said, what we need is a zonal a view of the whole thing that takes a lot of money but anyway that's happening for now um Bunbury road junction i've been pushing for us to get some kind of traffic farming there i'm now told we definitely have some money don't know how much to do some kind of intervention on the Bunbury road i have yet to be told what it is um but that's good that's a step forward that road is incredibly dangerous uh highways are looking at that alongside that i've been in conversation with both of st lawrence schools about their concerns about cars pulling up on pavements, cars uh, blocking the view of children, carers, parents when they cross the road, uh, making it safe for bikes, uh, foot, wheelchair, pushchair to get into school. So I'm mid conversation with them. Um, now there's potential with the, what I think is a lovely project, the low traffic neighborhoods. I'm fully aware they're quite controversial with others and I'm happy to hold those conversations. There's potential not for a low traffic neighbourhood yet, but for some small interventions around St. Lawrence. Uh, nothing's really been suggested or set in stone, really. We're just kind of taking ideas and talking to officers and residents. I'm aware it'll be relatively controversial. And uh, my stance on the St. Lawrence area is we need to do something. We need to take a bigger view of it and look to transform that whole area and how traffic comes through at speed uh, and in high quantity. So we'll put a pin in that. I can take your questions on the St. Lawrence area in a minute. Oh, I'm going for a walk around with the heads of both schools, not this week, the week after. We're going to walk around at drop off time and pick up time, and we're going to just look and see how safe it is, children, parents, carers, to get to school. That's happening next week after next. At distance, under the COVID rules. Quarry Lane. Um, we've got some traffic restrictions coming down Quarry Lane, which again has been asked for a very long time. That's mm -hmm. just parking restrictions right down Quarry Lane. That's because there's been a number of uh, collisions where vehicles have come down that road fast um, and they've hit parked cars. Uh, the residents there have been pushing for a long time to make that road more clear. Now, again, that doesn't really resolve the deeper problem. Uh, there's been a number of crashes um, on the junction of Pamela Road. A couple of people have been knocked off bikes. Uh, there's been crashes down Pamela with cars driving up and down fast. Again, that's an area that if we can get low traffic neighbourhood thinking and funding, I believe we can transform around the train station with some wise uh, and brave choices around how we use those roads. Last one is the Meadow School, and you may have seen on, on social media, if you follow me, this has been quite controversial. 
around there. So there's been some long standing um, discussions. They were giving a bit of money when they extended the school and it conversations maybe started eight years ago, Andy. Longer? Um, don't know. I wasn't here that long ago, but it was going on right. when I first came. So Yeah, it was going on when me and Beth moved here. That was 10 years ago, I think. So maybe 10 years. Anyway, so new build at the Meadows, uh, some money for traffic calming. Um, a large amount of money for traffic calming. That money then kind of disappeared and a small amount was spent. No, a small amount was signed off. When I became councillor, I said this needs to be spent. Because <laughs> Andy and others were saying this needs to be spent. So we got a load of traffic restrictions around the Meadow School and then traffic enforcement for them. So tickets, which is what residents have asked for. Of course, this has happened right in the heart of COVID. A number of parents have got uh, parking tickets and I can totally understand their frustration. Right. You're really worried about the safety of your child. There's a there's a uh, international um, killer virus, unlike anything since the Spanish flu, existential pressure. It was a ridiculous time for those parking restrictions to come in. It wasn't vindictive. It was simply that the process took an absolute age. It was begun well before I was cancelled. Anyway, what we're doing now with that school around the meadows is I'm going back to the council and saying, how come you took that large amount of money for transformative traffic calming? How come you took that off the table about just when I became councillor, two weeks in. Can some of that go back on and do some more changes around the area that don't just serve the residents, don't just serve the school, serve the parents too. So something truly communal. With that in mind, the new chair of governors has set up a new working group. She's asked me to chair. So um, the, some residents will be on that, staff will be on that, potentially a teacher, me, I'll be on that. Uh, and that'll be a small group looking at can we really look at the great work residents like Andy, uh, Gemma, Jason and others did, but actually put in place what they asked for, get the money back and spent. Oh, that's a lot of things to talk about. I'm aware there's a lot of people on this call from those areas. So do you want to pop your hand up if you want to ask points about this? And just to say, what I want is this to be a starting point. I'll broadly answer your questions, but then I'm going to set up in the coming three months specific groups for each of those areas. So if you live around train station we'll have a separate zoom call on that and we'll we'll really nail in on it if you live around st lawrence schools we'll do that live around the meadows we'll do that does that make sense good yeah right who's got some questions there's a, there's a couple of questions in the chat to Is cancer there? armstrong the yeah now. i've got to switch screens then hold on going back right is st lawrence road being blocked from heath road south if so, emergency services from the Bristol Road won't be able to help the most vulnerable people who are mainly old people. This doesn't seem right. So, um, my friend Lucy, who's on the call, I can say Lucy. So, Lucy, you'd put put around, we had a lovely chat about um, the document that had a whole range of road closure suggested on it that lots of residents uh, had saw and thought was definitely happening. That wasn't happening. There wasn't a plan to do any road closures. But now, now we saw that. And some residents saw it and said, actually, some saw it and thought, as Raki has said, uh, this wouldn't be good. Other residents have seen it and said, ah, this might be good. So, yes, part of the conversation will be, as a community, would it be worthwhile to trial some planters on one of the roads, potentially St. Lawrence roads? That is not written in stone. Um, that is simply because after that letter went round, I got a number of people really against it, a number of people really for it. And I'm personally up for those difficult conversations about how do we make an area safer? So just to answer your question, emergency services won't be impacted. They can easily get to both sides of that road. Yes, they can't cut through, but there's a number of other roads where they can. Emergency services now are incredibly smart. They will reprogram their devices to get through the roads. Uh, with regards to helping the most vulnerable people, uh, they will be able to get um, the help they need when they need it. Will not impede that. What it will impede, and I had this conversation with my friend Lucy at length, it will impede residents who use that as their own cut through to get through to other sides of Northfield. It absolutely will. There are no choices these days we can make politically, structurally, that don't have some kind of negative ripple somewhere. There are no good choices. There are just choices with impact. Um, I'm up for really having a proper conversation about this. Second point on that, traffic will be pushed on the Bunbury Road, which already has heavy traffic. Uh, yes, potentially some of it will. A lot of the studies from London where they've trialled these, they have found the traffic has reduced. More people have found other ways to get about. And the paradox is 
those who have to drive, the roads often become cleaner because if you have a 5-12% drop in traffic, it is clearer for those who need to get through. Those with disabilities or jobs that mean they have to go by a vehicle for multiple spaces. I'm certainly not saying this as someone who's anti-car. I believe some people need to have cars to get about. This kind of change makes it easier for those with cars if the traffic is reduced. That will push traffic onto whole lane as the nearest of Bumby Road to cut through. Yeah, and um, that's that's why I'm for me, this has got to be a, a wider plan than just one decision. Um, mm. Louisa. And in fact, I've had a conversation today. The problem with whole lane, to be honest, is it's um 20 houses are in my ward and the rest aren't. And the way the council often works is we don't actually have conversations across. So for example, if changes happen in one ward, such as the um the bus lane, and we're not going to talk about the bus lane. I'm not totally against it. I know lots don't like it. But I didn't get told. Um, I didn't get clarity on the bus lane because it stops before my ward. Another good, which which is incredible, right? It's not a great system. The other key example to use is, you know, the Long Bridge, Long Bridge have got the new park and ride. Have you all seen that? I had no idea what was going on there um, because it's not in my ward. And I have raised this. We need to have a flexible view of boundaries outside where we represent because you guys as residents and me as a resident, we just wander across, right? We don't see boundaries. Anyway, very long answer. Paul Lane will be fully part of the conversation. None of this will happen if it's definitely the wrong idea. Uh, if we trial it and it doesn't work, it then won't continue. Anything I ever do like this is fully consulted and will be uh, fully trialed and tested because I think the views of the people matter. Any more questions on that? Dave Morgan has had his hand up for quite a while. Pazzy, sorry, I can't see all the screens. I can't, I'm not multitasking well. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Do you want to ask your question? It was more of an observation. Yes, I'm a, a resident of Vintage Road. I live um, about four houses down from the school entrance. And you've just, uh, I think you said you was going to do a walk around the, the school perimeters uh, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. I don't think you'd see the actual true picture if you did that, because at the moment with the they're putting out these little co children cones to stop people from parking, um, and it's it doesn't now it doesn't reflect. Um, if you went now, you wouldn't see the true picture of what happens on a on a school morning, or really the worst time uh, we get congestion is uh, collection time where parents are queuing to pick up their kids. So I think. Um, while there's a COVID restriction on how kids enter schools, you're not actually going to see the true picture of the congestion that uh, you expect to see. That you expect to see. Um, saying that, I think um, I've lived here 30 years, and I think the biggest problem uh, that we've got, and I'm happy to take part in any debate you have outside of this meeting, um, is the is the disrespect for um, other for the pavement users and the parking on pavements uh, and double and both sides of the road. And a simple solution would just be to restrict parking on one side, and um, that would help, um, especially with child safety. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think parking on pavements, especially on schools, is 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 really horrendous because it's if you think about. So, if you don't know my background before I was a counsellor, I, I was an early years um, arts expert. So, when we were young kids, I mean, honestly, the the disregard for young children around schools, especially as vehicles get bigger, I find it mind blowing to be honest. However. However, in a rush, people are sticking a massive vehicle on a, on a pavement when there's little kids walking by. And when we're trying to encourage them to walk, incredible. Hiya, is that Lucy? Have you got your hand up? Yeah. Yes. Go on, Hiya. Then. Hiya, how are you doing? Nice I'm to see fine, you. thank you. Okay, right. Uh, St. Lawrence Parking, um, I agree with what Dave just said. At the moment, you won't get a true reflection of what it's like. Yeah. I absolutely we want to be included in anything that is decided. Um, you can see the school, you can see the parking from my house. I must admit, I often watch, find it quite funny, and I can tell you exactly how people park, where they park, uh, which you're not going to get from people from school, teachers, whatever, because they won't see it. Um, so yes, I really want to be involved. I, the my, I'm going to be really honest. The problem is selfish, lazy parents. It's nobody else. They park where they like, when they like, because 
they don't care about anyone else. And if you deal with the parents who are parking irresponsibly, then we wouldn't have the problems we have. You know my, my feelings, I'm just moving on. I will never, ever support any blocking of roads around here. Uh, you know that, Ollie, we've talked about it. Um, so again, I really want to be involved in anything that you know happens in the area thank, thank you. you as you know you'll always be invited to talk and as as you know we, we often we agree on some things listening we disagree on some things but i'm always happy to have you in the room because you disagree well and it's it, you know it's a joy to debate these things with you just to give a counterpoint to parents um as i've just said you know my background so feels some feels a different lifetime ago now i used to work with children from families that struggled now i'm aware some of them are under intense stress uh, especially if their children are having a really tough time um, for various reasons. So, of course, I understand why sometimes that the knock on effect parents are then potentially late, they might rush off to work, it might just be late leaving the house because their child is intense. So, I do totally recognize why some parents often have to drive um, both through stress and on through getting to work. But I don't personally skip, think that gives any reason why they should park dangerously. So, the key for me is not about annoyance. Um, Although I know it is annoying for residents. The key for me, the key angle is danger. How do we make our streets safe for children to cross roads by foot, by bike, push chair, wheelchair? That's the key thing I'm thinking of, and that's my priority for the remainder of the time on your council. Let me just see if there's someone else has asked the question. Oh, Kate, yeah. do you want to ask your Kate, question? Yeah. Hi. Um yeah, I, I've lived, my children went to St. Lawrence School and, and, and I got the job of collecting my grandchildren from St. Lawrence um, on foot. And, you know, it has been, the oldest one is now 20. So, you know, we're going back a few years. But even then, I, rec I remember collecting a child or two children from that Inage Road uh, entrance to the school. And... Uh, really having to be extremely careful crossing in each and then with the child you know holding my hand on the pavement at the other side being chased down the road by people parking you know with two wheels on 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 the on the pavement so we have to sort of bit you know run into a, a driveway that I mean it's absolutely dreadful it has been that that way for so many years so i'm agreeing with what has already been said and um, and maybe you know i don't know how how the how the council do these things but you know maybe it, it's necessary to have some professional uh survey people looking at the behavior the driver behavior on 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 image can i just say about the image bunbury uh woodland road um junction uh ollie when when we've talked about this before will you when you're doing your little list will you also remember guide dogs or people who use guide dogs yes because guide dog trainers will encourage people to use that junction uh to get to the park to exercise the dog, which is wonderful. But people take their life in their hands to get across, the, uh, certainly get across Woodland Road. So again, some, you know, some thought needs to go in to all the people who use that junction, who, who were at risk, huge risk. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I very much agree. So just to answer a couple of things. So I know a couple of people have said I won't get the, the true uh, impression of what it's like. No, I, I understand that. Um, I mean, just for those who don't know, I, I do live locally. I do live in Northfield. The only reason I, I, I stood as councillor was because I wanted to represent the area I, I live and work in. I'm, I'm, you know, I am highly political, but the truth is, as a local councillor, it's because I care about getting things done at the grassroots. So I know your area well. And I know, just as Kate's just said, it's it's a nightmare crossing those roads. I've got two youngish children who are getting out on their bikes more and, and um, scooters now. Uh, and it really, my heart shakes, you know, when they come to roads because it's it's so dangerous. Um, 
Good. Well, that's really helpful. Some really good feedback and thoughts there. Is there anyone on the call who wants to say anything or ask something? Uh, yeah, jo Joyce has got her hands up, Councillor Armstrong, and there's oh, a well, couple uh, of couple of two or three comments in the chat as well. You're a legend. Right, Joyce, you go first. Oh, you've got to unmute the show at the top. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm reading some of the comments on the chat regarding um, if St. Lawrence Road was ever blocked off at any point. And uh, there is an issue of displacement. However, I do live on the road and I actually see where the traffic comes from and where it goes. We receive all the traffic coming from Inage Road, Dimmore Avenue, we also receive all the traffic from Inage Road, Cornfield Road, Heath Road, and they both descend on our roads, so we get twice as much traffic as Inage Road and twice as much as Bum um, uh, Cornfield because we receive both. When they come to the top of our road, they either they appear to have come from West Heath to cut out Northfield and then they turn left and then right and go up Shenley Road or they come from um, Whole Lane, Cornfield Road and do the same. I feel it would improve the flow of traffic, it would reduce the traffic flow on Inage Road, it would reduce the traffic flow on Heath Road and Cornfield Road so it would not just benefit one road, it would benefit several roads. The traffic that uses whole lane, the traffic that uses whole lane is the traffic that tends to go towards town, not turning left and going towards Shenley, Hill, uh, Shenley Park. So it's a different set of traffic going in different directions. Whole lane's already busy, we're already busy. And the type of traffic that's using the road is becoming larger, quicker and increased in amount. We've got a park at the bottom of the hill. We've got children walking to school every day and returning home from school every day. It is potentially a danger. So I do appreciate people's comments, but I see where the traffic's going and where it's coming from. And um, I do appreciate those who live in Inage Road because having been a parent at the school and a teacher at the school, I know what the parking outside the um, school gates is like and it's horrendous. So uh, I do appreciate that. It makes life very difficult for the people who live there. But for certain periods of the day, morning and evening. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, and as I've said, through the things that, you know, in regards to what Joyce has just said, is that there are loads of opinions on this, and actually, I, in a way, I like that, right? Like when we're when we're looking to change infrastructure, or at least looking to start conversations about the communities in which we live, uh, especially as we're in a way we're trying to change the way we think as a society, right? Like climate shift is making us change, and it should, I think, change the way we think as a community. Uh, but also, COVID, I think, is has made us think. Well, how do we work as a network, as a community together? How do we think truly local? How do we make our areas truly safe for people to interact? without having to always be in vehicles. Um, so none of this is a done thing. This for me is simply a start of a conversation. Whatever happens, whether we trial some planters or not, and I hope we can trial, test some, but whatever happens, each of these conversations, I think we should use to start deeper conversations as a community, so that we're pulling people together over lots of different ideas. Uh, pardon me, so we can pull together the tension of agreement and disagreement, and whatever happens, we're respecting each other as a community and changing the place we live for the better. Is there anyone with any questions or points on the train station or the meadow school? Because there's been lots on St. Lawrence. Uh, Malcolm has his hand up. I'm not Malcolm, sure if it's on please. those questions. Malcolm, oh, that's me put my hand up. I didn't mean to do that. Asking myself a question. Malcolm, did you want to ask a question or are they all in the chat? If you're talking, uh, you must. No, I mute. think he's. On, I think you're on mute, Malcolm. Okay. I think you need to unmute ah, yourself. Right, I'm with you now. Fine. Sorry about that. Um, I've seen the comments, and I agree with the fact that uh, we need to have some improvements in traffic flow. 
but I think the uh, the blocking of St Lawrence Road could be really quite detrimental because it will only put more traffic under Bunbury Road. My question is, will you be able to draw a list of the potential restrictions, um, potential opportunities for reducing flow and speed to us so we can, as a group of people, look at the different opportunities, different options and make a decision? I would certainly expect all of that to be done. Uh, I would expect it to be all fully outlined so that every one of you has both the facts and the wisdom. So the facts, literally what we're saying what ha would happen, but the wisdom, I mean, experts talking through different perspectives. Um, I would expect us to have ongoing conversations as a community and to make the conversation and to do it respectfully with each other. But yes, that would be my perspective on it. Thank you. So if there's no one else with anything, I'm just aware some people said they were coming on to talk about Pamela and Quarry, but maybe they haven't come on the call, which is totally fine. So if you're watching this after it's been recorded in the coming days, uh, Pamela Road and around the train station is very much on my mind. I know there's been two horrendous crashes and two people knocked off bikes in the last year. So two horrendous crashes in the last few weeks, but a couple of people knocked off bikes. I'm really keen to make it safe for people to get to the train station. So okay. that is in our mind. Um, Sorry, jo so Joyce and Debbie have their hands up now. Okay, thank you. Would you like to go? Who, Debbie, do you want to go? You'll unmute if you're Hello. Talking. Hi. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I've come on from Pamela Road, but Average. I think it needs a, a whole separate yeah. meeting because there's just too many issues around Pamela Road at the moment. I think it'd take up the whole meeting. That's fine. Um, and it could do with more residents apart yeah. from just me. <laughs> There's lots interested. I am talking to a lot by private message and on Facebook, and I have said we'd do January. I just thought with this being the next World Forum, we'd start the conversation. So we'll put a pin in that and we'll call a specific meeting for that, if that's OK. Yeah, I wanted to say as well about St Lawrence. I think they're a bit of a victim of their own success because I sought out the register for the church because I don't know whether you know, but to be absolutely guaranteed a place at school, you have to attend church. And I look after the register for the church and let the school know who's attended and whatever. And they're coming from further and further away. So yeah. I know a lot of people are lazy and could walk, but there are people coming from quite a long distance that have to use the car. There's no other alternative because there's no way they'd get there on public transport. And that's a whole other conversation about the mm. footprint impact of faith schools, which mm. is probably enough for this time of this. Well, I'm happy to have that conversation as a person who grew up in. Because I, I, you know, that happens a lot. The schools in the area, right? There's, a, there's, they're, they're popular, and you understand why because people want to go to the faith based that they are, feel familiar with. Uh, but the foot, then the, the climate footprint of that is massive, right? People yeah. travel all over. Uh, so there's lots of conversations. To be I had mean, if you, if you were interested, a couple of years ago, I did a map of where people travel from. So if you wanted to see that, I think it is a couple of years ago now that I did it, but. It, you'd be surprised at how far they do come to go to St Lawrence. That would be really useful because that bears on the fact that people have to drive, right? So yeah. last thing I just want to touch on for anyone watching who's interested in the Meadows School. So myself and some volunteers have cleared the King George car park. I've uh, got the fire brigade to unlock the gates because the owner lost the padlock key. I've got signs which we've had sponsored and printed, designed by a school kid. We can fit over 70 cars in there. So unless, to my mind, unless you have a disability or your child does, I hope you can park at uh, the George pub. I've timed it. I've got long legs. Took me 126 seconds to walk. Now, I appreciate with young children, it takes longer. But it really shouldn't take more than a few minutes. So I hope we see more parents use that when they can. Uh, the key thing I've tried to change around the meadows, that's really frustrated some parents, and I do understand their frustration. But the amount of cars that pull up on the Bristol Road on the pavement, doesn't matter how wide it is, mm. I just don't want to see any kids get clipped or them to feel uh, in danger. Oh, someone's asked a question. I see. And I Joyce has still got a hand up. Oh, Armstrong. sorry, Joyce. Oh, no, I think she has. She just hasn't put it down, that's all. Um, I, all I wanted to say was we have to try to work out what our reasons for or against these policies are. Yeah. Is it is it purely we don't want to be inconvenienced because people will be inconvenienced? Or is it, you know, that they just have a dislike of being restricted on what they do? It's a bit like the people who don't want to follow COVID rules uh, because they don't believe in it or whatever. Or is it down to what's safe, 
safe for an area? What will benefit the largest amount of people with an area? Who will benefit from a, a certain thing? Um, and I, I feel that obviously if St. Lawrence Road did have a blockage, I would be this is, I would uh, find it inconvenient as well, but I would see the benefit for many roads around us. Um, and I've just named which ones they are earlier. Well, as Malcolm says, we're going to map all of that out in the conversation. And, I, and honestly, I hope I've showed anyone who's been to my meetings or any of my community work before. I hope you know that I, I will truly, you know, honestly listen to everything I have to say. But I'm also happy to make, you know, tough decisions on behalf of the community to try some stuff. Um, it's just been asked about can you park um can you park in between dropped curves around schools or park slightly on the grass i mean i don't think you should i don't think you should pull up on any curbs and i know it's really hard when you're trying to park by your school um oh just to say because i know there's some people on who are staff at the meadows school um you're also welcome to park in the king george all day it's unlocked you can go in get there early and just push the gates open it's unlocked um park in there i'm going to move on from the meadows school Again, just like the other two places I've mentioned, there'll be ongo ongoing smaller meetings around that. I'm really keen to hear from parents on that because I've had a lot of angry messages on social media. I had a parent mm -hmm. threaten me in the street, which I'm happy to cope with, but I'd much rather have a, a debate and talk about the problems as adults, uh, if you so wish. Oh, Louisa, the first thing that needs to happen is a blanket 20 mile an hour in all residential zones. Are you agree? And as I've said in every meeting I think I've ever had is I'm as frustrated as you as how slow things go and how much change we could do with what I think are pretty straightforward changes, like a 20 mile an hour for residential streets. Um, no pavement parking should be illegal. I'm as frustrated as you. It's kind of why I ran as council, but honestly, it drives me mad because the stuff we could do with simple change. Right, we're going to move on from that. We've got a couple more points to get through uh, before we wrap up the meeting. Um, so we've we've got a small local project running, which was funded by St. Modwins, which is called Raising Black Voices. Now, they haven't been able to come on the call, the young people leading that, but they'll be here on the 14th of December. They have had a small bit of funding, uh, which is signed off by me as councillor, and that's to look at the impact of COVID on black, Asian and ethnic minority families, and to look at the impact of racism on their lives in the area. Of course, we can use it to empower themselves to kind of to do some arts-based projects, some community projects in the area. I'm hoping they're going to feedback on where they're up to um, at the next meeting. It's a, it's a long term project that they're running. Very exciting and lovely. I'm going to now invite uh, my friend Marcia from the Northfield bid to have a chat about what's happening there uh, in this tough time for local businesses. Are you there, Marcia? Is she gone? No, I'm here. Thought, I'm you, here. I, thought, I thought I'd bored you and you'd gone home. Right, I'll hand over to you. Hi, well, um, not much really to say. We are going to be, well, there was a bit of mixed messaging from the government. That's all I can say, which ended up with a lot, quite a lot of us trying to get messages out to the businesses. Um, businesses are reopening on the 2nd of December. Do you want to just say where you, say where you cover? Because I think some people oh, might sorry. not know. Um, I cover... Northfield Town Centre. So from Carvel and Johnson on that side of the road to the orthopaedic hospital on that side of the road, then across the road I covered from what was then known as Gino's um, chip shop along that side to Hush Hairdressers, the opposite um, Carvel and Johnson. Then I also cover the four businesses along the side of the Relief Road. So that's the Neighbourhood Office, uh, Starbucks, the Sainsbury's, the Neighbourhood Office, I said, uh, the Black Horse and the, the Garage. So there's quite a lot of business. So it's in that area. So that's Northfield Town Centre. So I'm the Town Centre Manager for Northfield Town Centre Bid. Where the businesses, the 220 plus businesses that form uh, Northfield Town Centre, each pay a levy, which is ring fenced to be spent on projects that are to improve the trading environment for the businesses. So it creates a 
a visually appealing town centre appearance for customers such as yourself to visit the town centre. So we're the ones that clean the graffiti off shutters. We're the ones that remove uh, fly posters, the fly tipping, the litter picking. We, we're the ones that do all that kind of work. And we also provide the florals and the Christmas lights for the town centre. So that's some of the things, some of the few things that we do. But one of my jobs for the past few months is actually providing more business support for the businesses in regards to sort of translating the information from government down to the businesses in a quite user bite size format for them to kind of understand. So um, during the first lockdown, it was providing a um, recovery plan for the businesses to make sure that they knew that they had to have risk assessments in place. They had to make sure that perhaps they had COVID uh, insurance in place. So things like that. So my job's more like telling them how to, not how to, but sort of advise them on how to basically make their their business lives just a little bit more easier second lockdown basically just once again just farming out messages to the businesses just to let them know what and can they cannot do working with the council in regards to trying to find it and the police obviously to try and make sure our town centre was as free from business crime as we can be to um not displaced, but to try and um, work with the police and with others to try and work with the street drinkers and those that were um, abusing drugs within the town centre. So that's just been that's been quite a bit of multi-agency work with the council, with with Councillor Armstrong, and with other third sector organisations to try and help those people um, in trying to get them on that road to rehabilitation. Yeah, it's been it's been a difficult road. We reopened back cautiously on the 2nd of December. We we're in tier three and our hospitality businesses are the ones that are suffering. And all I can say is that whilst the whilst we have got a local thriving town centre, just ask business, ask your um, constituents to remember to shop local and keep our businesses viable for the future to come because otherwise if we lose our town centre then we lose out to those that are um, online that don't pay their dues in taxes so that's all I'm saying my message is to shop local and support Northfield Town Centre that's my message to those out there otherwise we become a ghost town which is what we don't want. Thank you Marcia just to just to back that up so I, I... I sit on the bid which Marcia manages as a, as a director, as councillor, and we um we really do need to look at how we help our town centre thrive. And I know Marcia and others and myself, you know, we have lots of plans to try and encourage independence and to, to just to try and make that town centre a place where people of all ages from all over want to come. And obviously COVID's really thrown that. There's a lot of businesses shutting. So yes, please do look to support it. And if you've got thoughts and ideas uh, on how we on how we transform it once we get out of COVID, uh, let Marcia know. Any questions on the town centre? Anything to do with the businesses or support? Any questions on general business support for me as councillor? No, that's fine. We'll, we will move on. Um, sorry, Ollie. Um, yes, sorry, of course, yeah. Ollie, at the last meeting, um, I think Janet, um, from St Lawrence Church spoke about um, empty units and, and I think one of your um, your electorates here mentioned about possible kind of vinyl or some kind of art or something like that we could actually um, sort of cover the windows of any the empty units similar to that in the shopping centre where they've got kind of like walls if we could just sort of kind of I did. I think that's something that I think you were going to take away. And I think Janet said that she might have some funding for that, and that'd be something that we'd be quite interested in. I totally forgot about that. I do apologise. I wonder was Janet saying it in relation to the arts trail? She I might think have... she was. I think she was in relation to a heritage lottery. Yes. Don't know whether she had any funding. I think she no, said she... there might be some funding for that. Yeah. 
but that's something that we would be really quite keen to have a look at. I've got a conversation with her about the Arts Trail. For, for the rest of you, if you don't know, um, there's the St. Lawrence Church uh, have run a really lovely heritage arts project over COVID, which really threw their plans. So they had to do it all on, online initially. But there's going to be a really nice arts trail through the heart of Northfield. It's going to be a lovely place to walk and go out. Um, I will speak to her, Marcia, about that. Yeah, because I'm sure that some of the shop windows could be used yeah. as some of the trails because I know that we are getting new business coming into the town centre but obviously at the rate that they're coming in we are getting um, national companies um, going into administration we yeah. just uh, we just have a very strong hope very strong loyal independent sector yeah. in Northfield I think there's only one that I know of that might be closing and that'll be after the Christmas period. But otherwise, it's just the the nationals that it's I a hear. Of big that ones are, gone, isn't it? We've lost. We've lost. Yeah, yeah. but we've, we've, we've got a strong it. independent sector. So I think we need to keep strong and keep on supporting them because they're supporting us. Absolutely. Right. So we're going to move on. Oh, sorry, to... we've got a Ooh, question from Amani. From Amani. Hello. Yes, I just wanted to ask. Uh, we've actually come across from the other side of Bourneville recently, uh, near the Sturchley High Street, which was never particularly a place that you would call a destination. So now they managed to sort of somehow turn their luck around, obviously disregarding what's happening now. They, they seem to attract a lot of independent sort of smaller businesses and they seem to be sort of clutching together now, which I think is, has been a really positive and, and has had a really great effect on obviously them also getting some money to revitalise Sturchley High Street. And I think um, I, I do use Northfield, to be honest. I don't find it particularly appealing to also <laughs> make that point. So I'm, I'm not sure whether there, there is something that in, in the long run can be done to actually make it more attractive for, for new businesses to sort of set themselves up there. And maybe I think what the one thing that sort of strikes me is that it's not very green. Obviously, you've got the uh, ring road now, you've got less traffic on the main street, whether it's worthwhile maybe working with Victoria Common to plant some trees that the locals look after, uh, which then cuts out the right. The money that gets charged by the local authority to keep them alive. Right, we have, right okay. Carry I don't on. know how to think that. Um, so my first question is, we, I would have to say we we're probably the most cleanest town centre possibly in mm. the south of Birmingham. The bid have purchased 44 floor planters, so we actually have florals throughout the whole oh, yeah. of the year. So we have two seasonal florals. You're right, there is a distinct lack of trees, and I only noticed that when it was actually pointed out to yeah. me. We don't have any trees on the town centre, and I have no understanding as to why. Um, I don't know whether Ollie can, I don't know whether there is anything that we could do about that but I very much I, I don't know about that I know there's trees Goodbye. along the relief road but I they've been growing for about six years so they wouldn't actually be in full fledgling at, at anything but you're right there is a dist mm -hmm. distinct lack of green the Victoria Common belongs to the council mm -hmm. and there is a friends of Victoria Common but I haven't heard or seen if they've met recently. Ollie, I don't know if you know with Sue, Sue uh, Amy. Sue uh, Amy used to look after the Friends group, so I don't know. No, um, they, they haven't. Uh, and, uh, they lost a lot of people, I think, unless there's anyone on the call from the Friends of the Park. I did try uh, and join it, but they'd lost their chair and they weren't meeting. But there is an, a Northfield Environmental Forum that I do know, and we were aiming to do some work with them, but I think it was dependent upon um, funding. Once again, we're in a kind of precarious situation where we are a not-for-profit organisation, but at the same time, we are a private limited company. So we have difficulty kind of attracting funding mm. so it's only if we work in partnership with another organization that we're able to do those things so perhaps mm. if i um k you've got my k's got my 
contact details. If Kay puts uh, gives you my details, we can have a perhaps have a chat about some ideas that you've got. Yeah, I can certainly pass those over for you, Marcia. Thank, thank you, Kay. Yeah. Lovely, thank Absolutely. you. So just to say, I, I totally agree with that. And just, you know, Marcia, I know we've had many of these conversations. I know you're passionate about all we can do to make the high street beautiful. And as you've said, you've done a load of work on it. And I think there's some real lessons to learn from Sturchley, but also some other places. And I think, annoyingly, we were just starting to have those conversations, weren't we, Marcia, looking at different things when COVID hit. So I know, yeah, I'm well up for being part of the broad conversation and, and Marcia helped manage that to transform that at High Street. And in, in this tragedy, there's some real opportunities. And I know Marcia has talked a bit about getting some more independence in and dig the dining club who are providing the food for our food support. They're keen to have a conversation about uh, what they, you know, some of their traders could bring. So mm -hmm. let's have that conversation. Anyone else who's interested in in that, um, give me an email or pop your email in the chat and Kate can uh, document it. And then maybe me and Marcia will set up a meeting in January with people. Is that okay, Marcia? I don't want to yeah, give fine. you more chat. That's January, yes, yeah, definitely. January. Yeah, so we'll yeah. call a meeting then. We'll have a, we'll have a big chat about how is a community we support Marcia in the high street. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Last thing on the agenda, unless someone else has got a hand up. Sorry, was someone just coming in there? Who did I cut off? No one. Marcia has gone. Right. King George Pub. Last quick point. Is Danielle on the call? Hi, Ollie. Hey, how are you doing? Hello, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Lovely to have you here. Do you want to just... Uh, yeah, so over? I'll try and make this quick because I know we, we're, you're finishing at eight, aren't we? Um, yeah, but well, you, you say what you've got to say. Yeah, I just, well, first, I think it's important that I just introduce myself to people because um, I've, I grew up in the area. I grew up in Rubery, um, went to Colmer School. Um, I've been a secondary school teacher for the last 10 years. I trained here in Birmingham. Um, I recently moved back to the area and I mean, really recently. So in the height of COVID, um, because my dad is unwell, I moved back um, to be close to him and discovered that the George pub was up for sale. Um, I'd already had in mind before coming back here that um, I, when I came back, I was going to try and do something community related, community led. And I'm really keen to use my skills as an organiser to do that. Um, and so I got very interested in what's happening to the George um, and, you know, having noticed what's happened to a lot of the other pubs in the local area, it's really come to my attention that I just feel very passionately that we have to try and protect some of these spaces um, and that they can be used for um, something that's a little bit more uh, community beneficial than luxury flats or whatever the plans are going to be. Um, you probably know if you have been interested in what's happening to the George pub that um, the owner has put in applica an application to turn the building into luxury flats, 13 luxury flats that I personally don't feel are going to bring anything particularly beneficial to the area. Um, I do understand that there are divided opinions about this and especially from people who live very close to the George pub who feel that perhaps, you know, that is the best course of action given the degradation of the building recently and I, I completely get that but I stand firm on the point that we are losing a lot of our community spaces. Um, I feel that now more than ever we need to look to a future that's a bit more hopeful for the community um, that you know the <laughs> There's so there are so many reasons for me why we why we need to save a space like this. Um, but uh, and I've heard some of them this evening actually. The you know just the fact that so much of our lives are going online at the moment, and do we, we don't really want that to be our future? I'm hoping. Um, so when we come out of this situation, you know what are we going to have left? What are we going to come out to? Um, I feel like. I completely agree with Ollie on, on wanting to change the community for the better for us all. Um, I see that there's a lot of problems, um, food poverty being one of them, unemployment now being a major one, the degradation of our high streets, as Joyce has just mentioned, you know, that community spaces can, can address. 
Um, I feel like there's the potential for this space to be somewhat of a business hub, an entrepre entrepreneurial hub, a culture hub. Um, I can perfectly visualize it, but I totally understand that there are very different opinions around this. And I would just like to invite people to um, let me know what they think. Um, I think it's best if you do that through Ollie. Um, but uh, just to let you know that I am the person that raised the online, online campaign on Facebook to try to um, to try to halt the the plans that Mr Khan has. That's the owner. Um, I would personally, it's a it's a great shame that I wasn't around on the scene earlier because I would have liked to have developed a relationship with the owner um, to try to come to an agreement with him about you know perhaps going into partnership with the community. Um, I think, unfortunately, it seems a little bit too late for that now, um, but I, I don't want it to be turned into luxury flats. Um, and I know there are about a thousand people out there who also don't want it to be turned into luxury flats. So um, we have the support from um, Gary Sambrook and Mayor Andy Street as well has um, offered uh, his words of support to try to protect this space. Um, so I guess what I'm asking you this evening is, um, what do you think? <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Is there any, and to be honest, again, like everything else I've said, there's probably like a subgroup of, of kind of deep thinking about this. And I really enjoy talking to Danielle about this because it's not just about this one building. As you said, it's about the understanding of community and space. So there's a lot of ongoing conversations we could have on this. Has anyone got any questions now? And if not, we can link you up with Danielle and myself to talk further. Can I just add something on Liz? Yeah, of course. Just that, um, if anybody is interested in this idea, a, a lots and lots of people mentioned a hub, a community hub online when I raised the campaign. And um, uh, I would just love to hear from you if that's something that you are interested in, because that's not something that it's not something someone can build on their own. You know, more than anything, what you need when if you're building that kind of place. And when I say build, I don't mean physically from the ground up. I mean, creating it. Then you need to have a team of very like minded people. And whilst I would love this to happen at the George, um, I do realise that there are a whole host of problems with with the George, the building itself. Um, so, but I I believe that there's room for this elsewhere. Um, so if it's something that you're you're into, then please get in touch with me through Ollie, Councillor Ollie. Thank yeah. You. So you can, thank you. That's uh, really lovely, and I hope the start of building something incredible here. So just before we finish. Um, I didn't do a council report and I just want to I just wanted to say a couple of things before you go, if that's all right. So there's been loads of really good things raised here, some exciting things happening, some controversial things happening, um, some passion, some tension. Alongside trying to fight for all these changes you guys want, um, I represent thousands of people across the ward. And because I try really hard to be accessible, which which I believe all councillors should be, that means I get a huge amount. I get hundreds of emails a week. And I just think it's really important that you know as well as looking to support all these great things that you guys want to see happen or change. Uh, every week at the minute, I get huge amounts of emails for food support. Um, people whose children have disabilities or who are struggling and they're not getting the correct support. Um, teachers, nurses, doctors who are totally burnt out and frazzled. Uh, people being evicted, even though they weren't supposed to be evicted over COVID. People losing their jobs, people with mental health problems. Um, I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this because for me, we need to transform how politics works and the way we transform it is we truly make it, it's not that we don't have leaders, it's that we have lots of leaders. Um, and something I've raised a few times is I want I want to build more things where there's more of our voices in it and we're all making decisions together, but we're also uplifting each other. And the candid truth is things are gonna get much, much harder. We're gonna see fast waves of job losses, uh, massive mental health impact, unlike any of us have seen in our lifetime. Um, so I'm asking you to truly, you know, lean on each other, but also if you need help to reach out. Um, if you have ideas and thoughts of how we can support the community, 
they'll ask me an email and, and I'll, I'll support you as best I can. If you're doing something already, I'm happy to signal boost it. If you want to get involved with the stuff that myself and others are doing, let me know and we will find you tasks. Um, but I guess the key thing as well is let's let's just be um, be be kind and decent as well because there is currently I think I think probably through through the tension that people are struggling but there's a rise of nastiness happening all over the place you know I've had much more I've always had threats because I'm on the left of the Labour Party right so some people just don't like my politics and I'm fine with that and I've always had people give me grief. recently I've had real serious threats from people and there's no need for that in local politics is there no need. So let's pull together. Let's work together. I've got another ward forum on December the 14th. It'll be on Zoom. You're welcome to come to it. If there's people you want invited, or if there's things you want discussed, let me know. Um, yeah, but thank you very much for coming. Is there any other business or any final questions before I let you go and I go get my glass of red wine? Uh, Kevin's got his hand up and Marcia did have a hand up, but I don't know if she still oh, wanted sorry, to uh, say anything. I missed you. Kevin, Kevin, you go, then Marcia will go after. Yeah, thank you. Mine's only a quick one. It's just about the alleyway next to the meadows, how there's constantly huge amounts of dog mess down it. Yeah. Is there anything that can be done? It's disgusting. I mean, this morning I took my daughter to school and it was literally just, obviously a pushchair or something being run through it, it just spread all the way down. And every week there seems to be new lots of weather like the rain might clear away but then you come in the next week and there's just more down there so someone some people person whatever obviously quite happy just to let their dog mess down there and it's next to school and it's just not acceptable in any way shape or form typically but especially next to a school and i think you know is there a way we can just keep it clear down there you know because obviously these people are going to not stop yeah so the very quick couple of things to say on that so one that's that's something I raise often too. It, it's an area me and other residents have, have swept and cleaned ourselves a few times. Um, I've asked the council, I've reported it a number of times. It says it shouldn't, it, we shouldn't be responsive, we should be proactive, we shouldn't be reactive, should be something should be done. In the grand scheme of things, that whole alley should have either been shut or uh, opened up into a proper paved wide alley when the school was done. They were the two options this, the council should have made. Close it fully. Um, and that and or oh, um, make it proper. Unfortunately, it's just a dingy alley. Um, where I think it's probably just two or three people with dogs, but they walk twice a day, and the dog takes a crap twice a day, and suddenly you know it's twelve every day. So that's the problem. If you email me and just put a complaint in, and then I'll take it to um, Thunder Parks, weirdly because it's not a highway, and I'll say something needs to be done. Truth is, they'll probably tell us they can't, and we'll have to probably keep doing it as a community. Um, but yeah, let's have a conversation about it. I, I totally agree. It's it's horrendous, and it's a big dog, right? There's it's always quite a large a mess right in the middle. Trim. Marcia. Sorry, I just wanted to come in from what Danny was mentioning about yeah. um, community hubs because I had this brainwave a couple of years ago, where we've got, where we've got possibly long-standing empty units in the town centre and what I wanted to do was actually create a social enterprise hub for businesses for people that want to have a place to start their own business so that's the I kind of idea I don't know I've not, I haven't gone I haven't got any further than that Let's so it up. Should, we, should we link up a chat in, in it in would be chat? interesting I don't know where we'd go though and I don't know how much it would cost but yeah well a start to start though Let's start. Let's. Okay. Uh, Danny, are you up for that conversation? Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. That's that's kind of the basis of my idea. So yeah. Definitely. Right, great. Let's. I'll I'll join the emails up, um, right. and then let's do that. Wonderful. So I've just put in the chat. You can find me via my email, or if you're on Facebook, Twitter, or I've just got Instagram. Just discovered it. It's just pictures of my dog. So if you're on Instagram, you can go and look at my dog. It's cute though, so it's all right. Um. So if you want to come and engage on social media, you can. You've all been a pleasure. I will see you all soon. Stay safe, stay well, look after each other. Good night. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks very much. Bye.